Hello to all of you and thanks for joining today. Uh, today's session is going to be focused on opening and closing conveyancing files and looking at best practices for onboarding clients and checks and reviews when closing the file. I'm delighted uh, to be joined by Ian Quayle, my colleague, colleague Robert Kelly this morning. Uh, good morning. Thanks Stephen, good morning everyone and thanks for joining us. Massive thank you to Stuart Title, Stephen, Robert and their team for organising these events and allowing me along to share what little knowledge that I have about some of the topics that we discuss. Today was sort of drawn to me by a very old friend, dear friend of mine called Michael Lamish, sister, who uh, was sort of uh, explaining to me that he thought he was uh, you know, doing a lot of work with regard to some issues with regard to file closure. And uh, credit to Michael, it sort of got one or two things buzzing in my mind and thinking, well, I spend a lot of time looking at transactional work, what I class as combat conveyancing, the sort of cut and thrust of the day-to-day -day activity. And I thought, well, hang on a minute. No, that you know, that's wrong. There's more to conveyancing than just that. So let's have a look at file closure. And I thought, well, at the same time, let's ha just have a reminder of what we need to be doing when opening files as well. So that's the purpose and that's the rationale behind the webinar. So thank you for coming along. This event is being recorded. There are notes and slides, as Stephen mentioned. We will try and allocate a little bit of time at the end to take questions. But if we don't have time or you're too shy to raise questions or you've got a complex question that you'd like to put, Please share that with me or share it with Stephen, who will make sure that I get it. If there's something of note or general consequence that I think it will be of interest to others, I'll anonymize the question, anonymize the response, and uh, share it with Stephen for general distribution, if that's all right with everyone. So hopefully you're sitting comfortably, hopefully you can see the slides, and hopefully you can um, hear what I've got to say. So a few things really to start with. Again, always useful just to remind yourself about resources. The PLA is now uh, not a direct and open access uh, website. You do have to become a member of the PLA. It is worth doing even though we're transactional property lawyers because there's a wealth of resources sitting there that you can utilize. Property protocols, I always mention about boundary dispute protocols. Interesting, uh, speaking to a barrister yesterday about a county court action that she just dealt with in the London Central County Court, where there was a dispute about a neighbour building uh, an extension to their house and allegedly um, trespassing about two or three centimetres onto a neighbouring property. The neighbour brought proceedings for trespass, which ultimately was successful. Um, and the judge basically saying, well, yeah, not only have you trespassed onto the neighbouring property, but because you've built your extension so close to their property, you've caused a problem with regard to airflow that in turn has caused a problem with regard to damage and with damp. And therefore, an order was made that the extension was uh, demolished. Uh, the extension had been built at a cost of £80,000, and there were over £200,000 worth of legal costs involved uh, in connection with the unsuccessful defendant being liable for the claimant's costs. So boundary issues, even relatively small boundary issues, can create vast problems and can lead, lead to all sorts of issues and difficulties, as that case uh, confirms. RICS website, Consumer Guide to Survey and Valuation, I always recommend. Leasehold Advisory Service, Leasehold Knowledge Partnership, Association of Residential Managing Agents, if you're doing leasehold work. I'm delighted to say that other than one point, I won't be talking about the Building Safety Act at all today, which uh, is a, a blessed relief, to be honest with you, given the complexities of the Act and all that goes with it. All those three sites are very useful if you or your fee owners are dealing with leasehold transactions. So I'll be touching on some issues with the regard to leasehold transactions and explaining to clients when we're onboarding clients what they need to know in a moment or two. So the first thing, if we're onboarding clients, if we're taking on and taking in, why do we do it? Why do we want new work? Are we wanting new work because we're expanding? Are we wanting new work because we have capacity? Or, my dread, are we taking on new work because we're jettisoning uh, the work that we've got and not providing clients satisfaction with regard to the work that we're doing. So we're always requiring new clients to take on to uh, replace clients that we're losing. As far as taking on new work is concerned, some key questions. One, why do we want it? If it's the reason that I just mentioned, perhaps we should be thinking more about spending uh, time and energy and resource on retaining clients that we've got rather than looking for new ones. If we are looking for new ones, what's their risk profile? 
and what's our firm's risk profile as a consequence? Do we have to revise our policies and procedures in connection with taking on new work? Do we have the staff that are trained and capable of dealing with it? And what's their view with regard to the work may be that staff have some ideas about acquiring work that you as a sort of department or a department head or a management a management a member of the management team in the firm haven't thought about it's often worth having a chat with the team because there might be opportunities for organic growth rather than for looking at sort of new pastures as it were relating to new work what sort of need do we have if we're taking on that work and do we really want it? You know, is it really necessary for us? And this issue of capability is so important. Capability with regard to processes and procedures, capability with regard to cash flow and funding, and capability with regard to risk and management. So all of those things need addressing. It's no good just thinking we need new work or we've got a new member of staff, therefore we need to expand the work that's coming in. There's got to be a reason behind that. And that could well be profit. On the other hand, I have seen firms that have looked at their conveyancing team to sort of supplement the work of other departments. So our commercial team might be really busy. And as a consequence, there might be captains of industry, et cetera or entrepreneurs or business people that are now using our firm for commercial work that are buying investment, residential property or high value property, and we need to act for them. It could be that we've taken on a new branch office or a new FIANA that has a, a whole new set of introducers that are bringing work to us. Again, rather than just saying, or glibly saying we'll take it on, let's analyze it and make sure that we can take it on and it's gonna be profitable. We need risk management and we need to, and this is something that was drawn out by the CQS guidance changes last May, we need to keep that under review. So it's no good having policies and saying, there you are, we've got a file, et cetera, relating to risk or relating to money laundry or whatever, and just putting it on the shelf of the head of department and uh, sort of using it when we're inducting new members of staff, et cetera, but not constantly reviewing it. Remember, one, one of the things the CQS guidance requires us to do is to have policies and to keep them in, under review. Further, we're required to analyze data that we get in connection with management of conveyancing files and again review our policies and procedures as against that data. We need to risk assess clients, each and every client, and risk assess transactions when we're onboarding clients and also I think to assess profitability both when we're looking at the client assessing what sort of cost we're going to be charging, what sort of profit we're going to be generating, what sort of additional benefit the introduction of this client to our firm is likely to produce. And this thing I think is so important on slide, assessment isn't just a sort of a one-off, but it's a continuous process. So it is something that needs to be looked at when we're onboarding clients, but it also needs to be reviewed. How many people have looked at a conveyancing file or a series of files and assessed just how much profit's been made on a transaction? It can be quite a scary process when you are sort of undertaking work at a relatively low level of cost. I remember years ago doing some work for a firm who'd just taken on a vast remortgaging uh, portfolio from a lender. And the head of department was doing some uh, assessment of profitability. And what he was saying was that the only profit they actually made in connection with remortgage files was the interest on monies that they were holding in client account. And that was it. If we did, if they didn't have that, they weren't generating a profit at all. Well, if that's the case, what's the point in doing it? You're far better pivoting resource and looking at types of conveyancing work that will generate profit. So as I say, assessing risk, assessing profitability is fine when we're onboarding clients, but at the same time, it's something that does need to be reviewed, perhaps reviewed on a monthly or quarterly basis. We need to be making sure that we have a compliance plan and that we comply with regulatory obligations when we're onboarding clients. So we need to look at anti-money laundering policies, fraud prevention policies, claim prevention policies and policies for procedure practice and review. One of the things that I think is so important about all of this, it's all well and good having policies, but are these policies implemented? Can you look at every file that every conveyancer in your team is dealing with and see the same thing? so that not only do we have policies, 
but our spheres are aware of those policies and everyone, and I mean everyone, is following them. I did some work recently with a firm that had four or five different branch offices, and it very quickly became apparent that each branch office was its, had its own separate regime. So there was a sort of an overriding sort of series of compliance plans and procedures that the firm had created, but different officers had different attitudes towards those plans and policies. Some liked them and adhered rigidly to the overall plans and policies that the firm had created. Some had created their own versions. And I remember one office had decided that they didn't like anything that the firm was producing and therefore paid lip service to it. But when you actually looked at the files, the files were being ran in a completely different manner. A nightmare, to be honest with you, and something that is going to be a real issue if you're subject to any form of inspection or examination. Um, I saw a matter before the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal recently in connection with money laundering where two partners had uh, provided um, on inspection a copy of their money laundering policy and all their documentation. All of it was completely out of date because it, it referred to the 2007 regulations and none of the staff and neither of the partners had had any training with regard to the up-to-date regulations. Well, that doesn't leave a particularly good taste in the mouth, does it? So clients, if we're onboarding clients, who are they? Are we getting clients that are old clients of the firm, in which case we might be able to relax some of our policies with regard to client identification, etc.? Or are we getting new clients that are new to the firm, in which case it may be necessary to strengthen those policies? Are they local or are they international or a variety of the two? Where client mix is changing, again, be aware of it. Are we doing a lot of co-ownership work, co corporate work, international work, in which case we might need to think about um, additional steps taken with regard to client identification or verification? What sort of transactional experience do our fearners have? What's the sort of spectrum of experience and knowledge? And is it necessary to upskill fearners so that we've got more fearners that are capable, for example, of doing leasehold work? or more experienced clients dealing with high value or high net worth individuals in connection with transactions. What about transaction types then? You know, are we doing lots of remortgage work? Are we doing lots of sort of traditional sales and purchases? Are we involved in flats and departments? Are we involved in rural properties? And do we have fee earners that are able to do it? Is it necessary to bring in new members of staff? Is it necessary to train existing members of staff so that they can be involved in new areas? With clients, it's also important when we're onboarding them to assess objective. So we might have a client buying a four bedroom uh, uh, terrace property in, I don't know, somewhere like Wrexham or somewhere like Wolverhampton. And at first blush, you might think, well, this is a standard residential purchase, but the client's objective might reveal that their intention is to buy this residential property, to live in it in a while for tax purposes, for example, and then convert it into flats. Well, in that case, it may be necessary for someone that's aware of the sort of commercial um, element of the transaction to be involved in it. So ascertaining client objective, I think, is always important. It's one of my sort of mantras with regard to every presentation, always ascertain any client's objective with regard to any acquisition be it a residential or a commercial transaction. When we're onboarding clients, where do our in, uh, inquiries come from? One of the things that I was told very early on in my career, one of the things I've always done in every aspect of my career, is to find organizations, entities or individuals that can refer work to me and then just simply to look after them. So rather than you know, looking after clients, which is a given in the conveyancing process, ascertain if there are individuals that can generate work for you, and then to make sure that that individual or that entity is looked after. So when we talk about onboarding clients, you know, a lot of people will say to me, well, the estate agency market is sewn up, they've got firms of solicitors, they're getting paid big referral fees, and we're not prepared to do that, so we're not, uh, targeting estate agents. Well, have a think about who else could refer work to you. Certainly accountants have always been a happy hunting ground for me for residential work. Um, other organizations that have worked in the past for me, citizens advice bureaus, all sorts of funny organizations that you might think aren't, don't want to have the slightest chance of getting work referred to you, but it's surprising how often they can. 
Um, do we profile target clients so that we're uh, targeting our marketing to that particular type of client? And remember, clients are individuals, and therefore it's important that the service that we offer is an individual service. Uh, service. This, is, I think, is one of the things that CQS have looked at, the SRA have looked at too. As we get more and more standardised with regard to documentation, the danger is that we start thinking about onboarding clients as a sort of uh, a collective rather than as individuals. So we need to look at procedures. Before I go any further, Robert, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, Robert, you've got some interesting points to note from an insurer's perspective with regard to when we're onboarding clients, et cetera, and some important things, I think, about sort of timeframes, et cetera, with regard to issuing of policies. Can you share with me and the delegates today uh, some issues and some points that I think are pertinent with regard to how a defective title insurer can assist clients when they're onboarding clients and in the first steps in the conveyancing process rather than instructing you when a problem arises. Have you got any comments to make or any uh, sort of guidance to provide in that area? Yeah, well, thank you, Ian. Yes, funnily enough, before that, I was just thinking when you were talking about processes and procedures across mm. firms, mm. Um, I've been doing some training recently with a number of firms on the insurance distribution directive. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, that you know, you know came in in 2018 with yeah. a flurry of excitement. Um, yeah. There are requirements in there to have regular training, to have mm -hmm. training when you onboard new members of staff. Yeah. And I think yeah, without being too rude, the more firms I talked to, I realised that it was done in 2018, hasn't been done since. Yeah. So that's another one of those matters. As you the mentioned, point. where you may yeah. have the procedure, but you do actually need to do it. It's not enough yeah. just to say have it in your file. Yeah. Um, so, but on yeah, just ways really to make things easier for you. Um, mm. There are a number of products, particularly no search products and so on, mm -hmm. where uh, you can get a quote on those, get a draft policy, get the premium fixed at the outset on our online system. Um, mm -hmm. And then they remain good for 180 days. So you've got right. six months there. Um, and it means if you complete, obviously some will fall away. But if they fall away, there's no harm done there. You're not paying for it now. But when you get to uh, completion day, it's one less thing you need to or exchange, one less neat thing you need to worry about. You can just go in and date it. So yeah. we do have a number of clients who where they use no search products a lot because of their acting for investors or on remortgages, they yeah. make part of the file opening process to get those quotes, yeah. have them ready on the file, and then just um, as and when they need them, uh, date them at completion or exchange. So it's just a way of hopefully making completion day slightly less hectic than it need be. It's a great point that. Well, so what you're saying and what I'm saying is that when we're sort of auditing a title, as it were, at the start, when looking at risk, that if we start addressing do we need a title indemnity policy we can basically gear up to get the policy if we need it as the transaction progresses as you as you say robert rather than having to sort of think about it during the sort of uh, the act the active period of the file where perhaps we've got a million and one things to do and perhaps a risk of overlooking the the issue of the policy or advising clients in that connection so what we could do is when we're doing an audit uh, early on in the transaction, when we're onboarding the client on a sale or on a purchase, if there is an issue that's flagged up with regard to an, a, the title, we can sort of have in place the policy, just simply ready to click a button, pay premium, and get the policy issued as and when necessary during the life of the file. Is that a fair summary, Robert? Yeah, that's right. And obviously also on the more procedural ones. So where you would always put in place your searches at the start yeah. when you open the file. If you're going to do yeah. no search insurance, get it yeah. there. You don't pay for it. Uh, yeah. It's only when it goes through. So it's there again. But yes, if you notice a defect, then uh, you can secure it then uh, at the time. Um, yeah. And yes, you can just make things easier for you as you go ahead. Um, yeah. There is, I think the, thing, the important thing is to get the quote, to get the draft policy yeah. and to fix the premium. You don't need yeah. to pay for it immediately. Um, yeah. so you do have that leeway. So you can uh, put it in your basket and then buy it when you need it. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose the other thing, Robert, is that, you know, from a, from an, it being an informative for the client, 
if you can tell the client right at the start what the premium is then that makes life a lot easier too doesn't it rather than going to the client and saying hey look there's an issue here we need search insurance or we need a policy uh and you know well, how much is it going to cost etc the client knows right at the start this is what it's going to cost if we need it exactly yeah, and that's why some of these firms who are doing yeah. regular work for investors yeah. and remortgages do that so they have it ready to go out to the client at the outset yeah yeah great thank you for that robert that's fantastic thanks very much good okay pushing on then providing information when we're onboarding clients estimate of time scale estimate of cost just as we were saying there we've got to provide our clients with details of costs there is a case called reynolds against stone row brewer that says that we can revise our cost estimate or our quotation if there's an objectively valid reason for doing so so if during the life of the transaction we become aware of a complexity we can charge for the work that we do relating to that complexity just for information you can't charge extra for advice relating to co-ownership generally you can't sort of charge clients extra for having to deal with requisitions from the land registry but if there's something weird and wonderful with regard to the title that wouldn't be expected in the standard transaction as long as you let the client know of the complexity of the additional costs and give the client the choice as to whether or not they wish to proceed or not you're fine to sort of uh, revise your costs at that stage the point I, I always labor is if you're in a situation such as that do make sure if you're not going to charge that you actually let the client know that you're going to have to do additional work and that it's part of the service so if nothing else you're generating some goodwill important that you provide information about communication how you're going to communicate, when you're going to communicate, and of course, who's going to be dealing with the file supervision, etc. You need policies with regard to money laundering and SDLT. Uh, again, with regard to SDLT, telling clients about what SDLT is, about their duties and obligations relating to SDLT, and if you can, estimate what SDLT liability will be incurred by a buyer at the start of the transaction. I think we do need to warn clients about property fraud and about the risk of property fraud, in particular seller identity fraud, and just highlight to buyers, it's out there and it could potentially generate a total loss. And I'm gonna do Robert's job for him for a moment or two. Uh, Stuart Title do have a product that will ensure um, the buyer in the, event, in the event of seller identity fraud. And again, as far as that is concerned, that's protective not only of the buyer client, but also of your firm on the basis that it potentially alleviates any risk of a negligence claim against your firm where your buyer client sustains total loss as a consequence of seller identity fraud. Uh, do talk to Robert or Stephen about that policy. I think it's really useful where you've got a client who's concerned about fraud because you can't as a conveyancer acting for the buyer do anything that guarantees protection for your buyer client. Um, and seller identity fraud all right reach the sort of heights of publicity with dream var and purrensing and all of that all those years ago but it's still out there you need policies with regard to leasehold transactions one of the things that's necessary i think at the start of a transaction is to explain to the client the bigger picture of what leasehold actually means and a lot of firms these days are now when they're uh, onboarding clients in leasehold transactions are providing information sheets about things like keeping pets, about Airbnb letting, just letting clients know from the start that in most cases, they're not gonna be able to undertake Airbnb letting in connection with flats or apartments or leasehold properties. And again, explaining to clients right at the start, even before we've received a draft lease, the fact that most leases will have restrictions on the keeping of pets. On that note, I said I wouldn't mention it, but uh, you know, about warning clients about the implications of the Building Safety Act might be something else that would provide to the client in a leasehold transaction when we're onboarding them. When we're scoping the retainer, we can provide additional information that supports or endorses the limitations relating to the retainer. Money laundering policies we know about. Um, important, to, again, that we review our policies where we're attracting new types of client or more clients. SDLT policies, again, might require revision. So where we're acting for clients in the past that were traditional resi clients in sort of an urban context, and we're now acting for clients who are buying property in a rural area or a high net worth individuals buying 
farms, estates, etc., we may need to revise our SDLT policy to take into account the peculiarities of agricultural purposes, mixed-use purposes, etc. Going on from that, as far as our money laundering pro pro processes are concerned, do watch out for interdepartment transfers of clients with regard to money laundering. So again, you know, from a, a criminal perspective, if I have a relationship with a member of the commercial team, for example, or a member of the private client team, there is a danger that when I ask a member of the conveyancing team to ask act for me, the fact that the firm is already ask, acting for me might mean that there'd be less um, rigor with regard to money laundering uh, processes from the conveyancing department. Do watch out for that. Uh, red flags with regard to onboarding clients. Well, who is the client? Remember, there's no such thing as a collective client. Unusual transactions, unusual transactions for the firm, unusual transactions for the client. So you've acted for Mr. and Mrs. Smith, who for the last 20 years, they've been buying up terrace properties in Cardiff or buying up um, terrace properties or investment properties in the northeast of England. And all of a sudden, they're now asking you to act in connection with the purchase of an 11 million pound flat or apartment in Park Lane in, in London. Well, you know, why is this transaction uh, arising? What's, you know, this is unusual. This is outside the normal type of activity that that particular client gets involved with. Unusual circumstances. So the transaction that needs to be taking place swiftly. An unusual circumstance, a client sort of selling or buying from members of the family unusual sources of funds and geographical issues, again, <coughs> might be indicators that something is awry. Um, as far as individuals are concerned, what about politically exposed persons? Not necessarily you know, MPs or government ministers or anything like that. It might be a relatively low level amount of political exposure, but nonetheless might be an issue for us. Who are the beneficial owners of property? Of course, we've got the overseas entity issue that I'm sure you're all familiar with, with regard to corporate clients and trusts, but even in a sort of standard co-ownership or a situation that was just put to me recently, uh, a client buying a property on an online auction on behalf of himself and four business associates. Well, in those circumstances, is the title going into the name of the person that is a successful bidder? And is there a trust then in connection with the other four people that are contributing towards purchase price and who is the client or who are the clients in those circumstances. Sanction exposure and jurisdiction exposure and issues, adverse media issues as well might be something that we're taking on board when we're onboarding the client. Property and mortgage fraud, again, not just looking at the client, but looking at the conveyancer or the other, on the other side of a transaction or the party on the other side of a transaction, undertaking a risk ass assessment and making sure that if there is a risk assessment and we're of the view that this transaction is out of the ordinary and perhaps therefore of a higher risk, making sure there's enhanced policies in place with regard to that enhanced risk and making sure that there is a there's visual evidence of that exercise taking place. We've discussed seller identity fraud already. Leasehold policies, I've mentioned the bigger picture, explaining to clients the likely things that we're going to encounter with regard to leasehold transactions, the term, ground rent and service charge, ground rent review provisions for older leases, and the Building Safety Act 2022, of course. Moving on, making sure that we specify our terms of business, making sure that we also scope our retainer when we're onboarding clients. I think scoping the retainer is so important. And Stephen was mentioning the sort of the catalogue of previous webinars that I've delivered on behalf of Stuart Title. Do have a look at some of the work that we've done together in connection with scoping the retainer, telling clients what we're going to do, explaining if we are doing things with the involvement of third parties, who those third parties are, explaining the limitations of our role and making sure clients understand that there are things that won't be done, there are things that are outside our expertise. Remember some of the things I've said in connection with reporting on title, for example, to make sure clients are aware of the limitations of searches, the fact that we're reliant on search companies or um, search organizations to produce information for us. All of these sorts of things need to be clear. Again, making sure the client is aware of what we're going to do, 
and also what we're not going to do as well. Making sure that the client understands our role and making sure that the client understands the parameters within which we're working. On the issue of scoping the retainer, remember that it might be necessary to extend the scope of the retainer in circumstances where a transaction becomes unusually complex or requires us to do work beyond the retainer um, in order to enable the transaction to progress to a satisfactory conclusion. Next thing to talk about, file management policies, making sure that we have from the outset transferred to our client information about the methods of communication, about issues associated with confidentiality, about how we're going to do with, deal with risk and what key dates are likely to arise in the conveyancing transaction and making sure that when we're opening files all our case management systems are open to enable all of this data to be uh, included and incorporated for future uh, transactional activity. Um, one or two things to discuss or mention relating to file management when we're onboarding the client. With regard to communication policies, so important, I was talking to someone earlier today about client complaints, so important if we have communication policies that we stick rigidly to them. The moment that we have a communication policy but we have a client that's bleating about the fact we're not communicating efficiently etc there is a danger that in order to placate the client will say well all right you know from now on i'll report to you at the at close of play in connection with every transaction with in connection with every day every business or working day well if that's not your standard policy i think moving away from your existing communication policy and offering the client that sort of facility is a recipe for disaster stick with what you've got no matter what the circumstances with regard to how you communicate with regard to confidentiality issues watch co-ownership and make sure as we'll be going to be talking about before we finish today make sure that when we're onboarding clients and opening files the clients are aware of what will happen when the file is closed and when our task is at an end which leads me to talk about file closure. And I think the important thing with regard to file closure is to first of all appreciate that, and again, I was discussing this issue this morning, a lot of conveyances, a lot of inexperienced conveyances think that the major hurdle in a conveyancing transaction is getting to completion. And of course, that's not right. As we gain in, in experience, the, the key issue then becomes getting the title registered. And then, you know, the closing of the file is, in my view, an important step. But file closure isn't a simple process and does require policies, some of which uh, I think require sort of tuning or addressing. So the first thing I think when we're going to close a file is to make sure that we've made client contact so the client is aware of what we're doing. And I think in doing that, there are some useful reminders advising clients to keep addresses for service up to date and the importance of that mr client if you don't keep your address for service up to date at the land registry and the land registry need to communicate with you they will do so via that address and if it's out of date that's your problem not the land registry's problem and scare the client you know explain the fact that potentially someone could claim adverse possession to the title and you wouldn't be aware of it where the land registry was unable to contact you or a unilateral notice being placed on the title and the land registry attempting to contact you and being unable to do so because your address for service is no longer in use. With co-owners, I think we need to give advice to clients, particularly with regard to deeds of trust, to keep them under review. Perhaps to advise clients that where a joint tenancy or a tenancy in common has been agreed and is has been sort of uh, dealt with within documentation, the fact that it might be necessary as time progresses for that um, co-ownership and that format to be changed or be subject to review. And something that has arisen as a consequence of some recent case law, do I think warn co-owners in particular about the dangers of exchanging emails with fellow co-owners on the basis that an exchange of email could amount to a transfer of a beneficial interest. 
if the client isn't careful. So where there are disputes or where there are relationship breakdowns or the purpose for which the co-ownership was established is coming to an end, the client should be warned about negotiating uh, with fellow co-owners about what is to happen with the beneficial interest. Uh, duties and obligations concerning defective title insurance. Again, in my view, important to let clients know that although I'm now out of the picture, you have a defective title insurance policy, you have a contract with Stuart Title, for example, and that will oblige you to notify Stuart Title in the event of any information coming to, across your path that might impact on the policy, or where you receive some form of notice that could lead to a claim. So making sure that clients are aware of that ongoing obligation. To make sure clients are aware of what documentation you're holding and what you're going to do with it. And to uh, ensure that you do a review of the file for a number of reasons, as we'll see in a moment or two. So I think we need to do this file audit idea. So have a look at the documentation. Whenever I mention this, I always smile and think to myself many, many years ago, about a very, very interesting exchange I had with a former client of the firm that I was working for whilst I was getting ready to play golf. So I'll tell you the tale. I'm putting my shoes on, getting my golf clubs out of the boot of the car and down the golf course, uh, the golf club car park comes this former client of the firm looking very, very irate. And I'm thinking someone's in bother, not thinking he's coming to see me, but he comes to see me. Fortunately for me, his venom wasn't aimed at me, but aimed at a former colleague of mine. What had happened is the firm had acted for this particular client in a conveyancing transaction. And at one point, my colleague had gone away on holiday for a month, very nice, and had left a file note for me about the client. The file note, let's put this as diplomatically as I can, wasn't particularly endearing about the client, shared with me the client's unreasonable attitude, the client's foul and abusive language, uh, all sorts of very interesting comments about the client that should never, ever have been disclosed to the client. I was told by the client that some four months previous, he'd asked to see the file not for any sort of purpose with regard to a claim, etc., but just he wanted to see something in connection with an exchange of uh, uh, correspondence relating to something that the seller had said or not said in the uh, inquiries before contract. And he'd got the file, he'd read some of it very early on, but about two or three day, days prior to his encounter with me, he'd managed to read all the file and saw the note from my colleague. If nothing else, that revealed to me how cautious you must be with regard to checking files when you're closing them. Because when a client asks for the file, you might not have time to do a full audit to see what the file contains. So do check documentation, correspondence, file notes, etc. Assess risk with regard to potential for claims. Assess whose documentation or what parts of the file belong to the client and what could belong to others. So you're doing a check to see if this file is released, is it safe to be released? And then check account ledgers. Again, you know, the odd balance on client or office account might lead you to undertake a review of the file and find out there's been there's an outstanding apportionment or something of that nature, or there's something due to the client. There's been guidance given by the Law Society on the 26th of July. There was also formally an, early, an exit strategy toolkit and, of course, the CQS guidance as well. Your firm should have a policy with regard to file closure that everyone should be aware of. On the issue of firm policies, there's another point that I haven't made as yet, and I just want to share this with you. Um, we're talking earlier, Robert was mentioning the idea of new recruits, etc., being aware of policies and procedures that your firm has. And I mentioned when we're onboarding new members of staff, uh, it's important that they're aware of policies and procedures that we have. But also do think about locums. You know, if a locum is regularly doing work uh, with your firm due to holidays, absences, etc., are they aware 
of firms policies and have you got evidence of their awareness so documentation has been produced for them to have a look at so that when they are doing work for you they are complying with your policies and procedures i think that's something that can frequently be overlooked file closures who's the client so have we got the individual client what about co-owners what about owners of beneficial interests and what about lenders again with regard to co-owners i think that uh, when we're onboarding the client we should make the clients aware of what would happen if there's a dispute relating to clients perhaps the the nature of that awareness should be if there is a dispute we won't be able to act for either of you uh, if anyone requests information we'll provide that information but we'll equally share whatever we're providing to client a to client b or make them aware that that documentation is available to them if they require it i think the other thing with regard to clients is to watch out for owners of beneficial interest you know are they a client what are they entitled to and again just check your lender's instructions too so who does the file belong to well some of it will belong to the client or clients some of it will belong to the lender and some will be belong to the conveyancer in connection with the lender client sort of mix there will be some documentation on the file which will be common to both i've given you details in the notes but it is important always to think about if you're contemplating releasing the file who is the client and who does the file belong to and what are they entitled to some practical issues i think if a request is made from a client with regard to the file we should treat it as an important issue and endeavor to comply with whatever is being requested of us as efficiently as possible failure to do so will lead to complaints you'll see if you look at the legal ombudsman's um, um, uh, website you'll see some of the comments made relating to releases of files etc and do be aware that the legal ombudsman has just changed some of its practice uh, as of april this year so you can have a look at the legal ombudsman's website it's always worth doing that to see what sort of complaints are being made and to see what the ombudsman is suggesting is good practice particularly with regard to dealing with complaints remember that if a client is asking for a file or asking for part of a file this might be the last point of contact that you have with that client so it might be that if you're seen as being very efficient and very supportive and very productive with regard to the documentation that leaves a very good taste in the client's mouth or on the other hand if you're very dilatory or sort of very slow to react or very negative with regard to reaction that could be seen as a very bad thing so we need to look from a practical perspective as to how we deal with clients requests there's another point relating to that that i want to mention to you before i finish today as far as file closures are concerned remember that we not only are or need to contemplate requests for the file but also we need to think about data protection and subject action access requests for personal data held that personal data may not in fact be data that's held on the file but may be held electronically again just be aware obviously that it is necessary to comply with the relevant law relating to data protection this is something that i think people don't look at with regard to files i think it's important to check your professional indemnity policy to make sure that your file release policy or process doesn't conflict with your obligations to your professional indemnity insurers so where you get a request from a firm of lawyers for the client's file i think it's reasonable to ask why and i think if you get a reason on the basis that there's a client complaint or an allegation clearly that's a matter that needs to be subject to uh, a disclosure to your insurers again it is important in my view that as far as file closure is concerned you do think or you do do an assessment relating to claim risk in any event as an internal process but certainly where someone is requesting the file be it the lay client or a legal representative requesting the file on behalf of the client we should be asking why on closed file policies there's another practical point it's all well and good having a current policy relating to file release or file closure but it's important to assess when you received instruction 
from the client what was the policy at that time and to make sure that you're complying with the relevant policy at that point in time rather than the current policy because the client is perfectly entitled to say well hang on a minute you know in your uh, retainer letter in your engagement letter to me you, what you were telling me about the release of the file or the retention of the file or the destruction of the file is different to your current policy so do be careful about that can we charge for the production of documents well the answer to that is yes we can um, which leads me to another point that I want to share with you be careful when you've closed a transactional file down and the client then rings you and asks you for advice or guidance so let's assume you acted for me two years ago I ring you or I email you this morning and I say you won't remember me but you acted for me on the question of the purchase of 14 Acacia Gardens uh, lowest off um, and I've got a problem the problem is that the neighbor is saying that our land registry title plan is wrong and is also saying that a fence that I've erected is in the wrong place in a situation such as that it is important to understand what your role is the client is not a client at that juncture the client was a client unless you, your firm has a policy of some form of sort of retention of clients on an ongoing basis which would be highly unusual then if the client is wanting advice or explanation or guidance relating to the boundaries of their property then that should be a new matter and you would need to uh, send out an engagement letter and to scope the retainer with regard to that issue now the issue potentially is a boundary dispute so you'd refer it to your property litigation team or advise the client that your firm doesn't do that sort of work there is a danger that you attempt to assist the client on the basis that you become worried that if this potential dispute becomes an actual dispute and if your client heaven forbid sustains some form of loss as a consequence there is a risk of a claim then coming down the tracks to bite you at some point in the future and therefore human nature being human nature there is a danger that you try to provide assistance in those circumstances i would always advocate that you steer clear of providing that sort of informal assistance what i would do in a situation such as that is i would say to my client i will send you a copy of the report on title that I sent to you when you acquired the property and I would do nothing more I certainly wouldn't provide any off-the-cuff advice that would be highly dangerous I certainly want to be wouldn't want to become embroiled in what potentially could be an expensive dispute I just mentioned to you early this morning about a case that someone was telling me about yesterday so do be careful where clients contact you when you've acted in the past asking for help or assistance on the basis that you know you don't have to provide that information for the client uh, unless the client is willing to pay you or one of your litigation colleagues for advice and assistance in the area that they require i think that is so important and something that is frequently overlooked there was a case just recently in the court of appeal where that sort of issue was raised the, the case of spire and uh, with us solicitors which i'm sure you'll have all seen before we finish today we need to talk about cqs guidance relating to file closure insofar as it relates to your firm it's important that you are aware of the cqs guidance with regard to procedures for file closure the need to preserve client confidentiality or the confidentiality of others lenders for example that have been instructed to undertake file reviews on file closure and to ensure and preserve proper and reasonable file management so i think it is important that even if you are not cqs compliant and you don't have to be i think it's well worth having a look at the cqs guidance as a sort of suggestion of good or best practice and certainly the point that i want you to take away today is to have a look at your file closure system to make sure that you are reviewing the file not just to see if there are any outstanding issues from the transactional side of things but to see if there is the potential for any claims that could be brought 
in connection with the file to have a look if there are issues with regard to work that will be required to be done going forward. So I was talking to someone last week and there was a need to submit an additional SDLT return at some point in the future with regard to, um, I think it was an overage payment that hadn't been properly calculated as at completion or something of that nature from memory. It's this sort of thing. And also making sure that when we are dealing with the release of documents or the release of the file itself, that process is as smooth and as efficient as is possible. Being um, aware of the need to provide assistance to the client, but also being protective of our firm and ensuring that those that need to know about issues arising from the disclosure of the file are aware of those issues. So, conclusions. Beware requests for subsequent adv advice for, con for conveyance from conveyancing clients. Discourage fearners from uh, providing advice from memory. Understanding and appreciating that if requests are being made for information in connection with a historical transaction that you're entitled to be paid for whatever you're being asked to do be aware of and of allowing transactional property lawyers to provide assistance to clients in connection with matters that have the potential to become contentious making sure that your property litigation team or whoever is taking the lead with regard to the matter Make sure that everyone in the firm, and I mean everyone, is aware of firm policies and make sure that firm policies are reviewed depending on the sorts of work that you're changing and that the nature of your work can and will change over time and that you and your policies need to change with it. Make sure confidentiality is pre preserved or where clients are willing to waive confidentiality that there is a written waiver on file that protects you in that connection. What I'd like to do now, Stephen, because I think we've got three or four minutes left before we finish today, is to open up and ask if there are any questions. So, Stephen, do we have any questions in the chat box or in the questions section of the uh, the um, screen there? Is there anything that's come in? Absolutely, there is. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Um, yeah, yes. just as, as a reminder, um, we, we are now going to begin answering the questions, so you can submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Uh, we have a few already, so we, we might just leave it at this, Ian. But, uh, okay. um, and the first question actually is possibly one that yourself and Robert could both have some input mm. in, uh, from Mark Kens. He, he mm. asks, would the need to arrange a relatively straightforward indemnity policy justify an additional cost charge to the client? Well, if I take the lead on that, Robert, my view is that, yeah, you're entitled to charge for the work that you do. You can't just charge a flat fee because you've got to take out the policy, but there is some work that needs to be done in that connection, and therefore I do think you can charge me. Robert, your view? Um, I agree entirely, Ian, but I mean, one of the good things and, and one of the reasons why we developed the uh, Stuart Solution Online platform is mm -hmm. to try and streamline that. Um, in the old days where you need to send emails through to insurers or to brokers explaining the problem, then get queries back, then get a draft policy, it can take half an hour of your time quite easily to arrange a very standard yeah. policy. With an online system like Solution, you can order yeah. over 150 different policies, um, and even yeah. for somebody like me who is a computer dinosaur, you can get a draft policy and a quote within 90 seconds. Um, yeah. With cover uh, for uh, up to 20 million pounds in some cases. Yeah. Uh, so the idea is that um, it cuts down that cost, and it does yeah. mean that you can offer that opportunity of insurance to your clients without it eating into your profit. Um, yeah. We have uh, just recently we're in the course of updating the system to include uh, variable assumptions of fact in there so that mm -hmm. uh, rather than the rigid criteria which some online systems yeah. require you to meet there will be flexibility again that will mean you're in control and that quote will be there so yes if you're involved in a complicated issue uh, you're entitled to charge for it but hopefully mm -hmm. uh, systems like solution will mean it's not that complicated anymore for you brilliant thanks for that robert robert the other thing is uh, any comments about file closure from your perspective as an insurer 
all I was thinking when you were talking was that we quite often get requests from firms, uh, sometimes months, indeed sometimes even years after completion, mm -hmm. uh, saying, can we put on risk this policy we've got a quote for? It tends to be on the whole the smaller ones, mm -hmm. and I suspect that somebody is closing a file and finds £7.50 or £15 on there, and they realise that was a chancel policy or a building regs policy. Um, again, with solution, what we did there uh, is that every policy can be backdated up to 30 days. Right. So uh, whilst I know you're not necessarily doing your file closing that quickly, if you are mm -hmm. just looking through client accounts and you realise you've missed putting something on risk at completion, you can backdate it by 30 days. Yeah. That's within yeah. your control. Beyond that, you can request it. And in the majority of cases, Providing you can confirm that the client and you are not aware of any changes in the assumptions, that policy can be backdated. But hopefully, right. uh, the 30 days helps you with most problems. That's useful. Thanks for that, Robert. Thank you. Stephen, any other questions? Thanks for that, Mark, yeah. by the way. Good question. Thanks, Mark, and thanks both for, for the answer there. I'd, I'd say close to the hardest sell we've ever done on these webinars, but I think very fair points made by, by Robert there. Um, mm. I have a couple of questions from uh, Zara. Uh, yeah. Zara asks, uh, a question that often pops up, are we meant to add VAT onto disbursements? Example, if you are charging £300 for search fees, which is a disbursement, would you yeah. charge like, 300 plus VAT? Yeah, there's, there's case law on this, isn't there, Stephen? And I can't remember what the conclusion was. Do you? Can you remember, Robert? I can see my notes going back for this a few years. Great question, by the way, Zora. Um, I was just trying to remember that as well, Ian, because I, it differentiates, doesn't it, between yeah. the type of disbursement yeah. and whether you are providing a service. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember. There may well have been case law since I last looked at it. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a feeling that you did charge it on searches for I some thought... reason. I couldn't understand the logic behind it, but I think you did. Yeah, but what I'll do, Stephen, is I'll scurry, well, I won't be able to do it today, I won't be able to do it tomorrow, I'll scurry home and find out the answer by looking at the case law on it. But I've, I've got a paper on it, I know that somewhere. So, Zara, once again, a brilliant question, I'll dig it out and uh, get it sent to you. There was also some Law Society guidance, I'm sure, as a result of that case, which again, I can find for you, Zara. Uh, Stephen, if I may, I'll share what I dig out, and then you can share to any delegates that are interested or uh, make it available, if that's fine. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Good on that one, Zara. So good. Well done. Um, that's great. But I'll, I'll get the answer for you. Any other questions, Stephen? One, one final question, I think, Ian, uh, and that's uh, again from Zara. So mm. earlier on, just when you first started talking about file closing mm. policies, uh, Zara asked, where can we get such file closing policies? And I think she was talking about the suggested file closing policy checklist. Yeah. Kind of if you, Is that available if you, anywhere? Yeah. Stephen, in the notes, I think there's the relevant website links. Fantastic. Okay, and if Zara has a problem, just ping me an email and I'll, I'll, I'll dig them out, but I'm sure they're in the notes. Perfect, thank you. Um, Mark Cairns come back just on the VAT point mm -hmm. and said most pre-contract searches have already had VAT added, and so the mm -hmm. client does not need to be charged VAT again. Right. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, could be right. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that'd be right. But I'll, I'll check it out. All right. Perfect. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ian. I think that's uh, all the questions for now. But if anyone does have any other questions, please do get in touch after the webinar and uh, we will do our best to respond to, to all of those. Um, that just leaves me really in, unless there's anything you wanted to say in closing. No, just thank you. And uh, as I say, keep looking at Stuart Title's website just as you, just to see what that what you're about. And, uh, you know, Robert mentioned these sort of online policies, et cetera, which are really useful. But also remember that Robert and Stephen and the team can also create bespoke policies for you too. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, everyone. Thank Stay safe and speak soon. Thanks, everyone. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.